We're now into the month of July, which is also the anniversary month of Disneyland. So today on the podcast, we start a new multi-part series, which will touch on the opening of that park. Last fall, we put together an 11-part story that looked at the opening of Walt Disney World. And as part of that story, we explored the battles between the operations team who manages the parks and the web design team who creates the parks. Over the next few weeks, we will take a look at the beginning of that story as it unfolded in the early years of Disneyland, largely through the experience of Dick Nunes. As Disneyland expanded, Nunes was central to the operation of the park, and as Disney World prepared to open, Nunes was central to the completion of that resort. As some of you may know, Nunes has an autobiography of sorts coming out this fall. A large part of it certainly will be focused on events long after the materials in this podcast series. In his management of Disney World and the opening of Epcot, Hollywood Studios and Animal Kingdom, and the resorts in Tokyo and Paris. His book, according to the publisher, is described as, quote, a series of wide-ranging vignettes. And from listening to Dick Nunes speak many times, I suspect that his book, if arranged like his speaking presentations, will likely be organized around individual experiences with an eye toward how these experiences highlight concepts of successful management. I could be wrong, I haven't seen the manuscript, but that's generally his presentation style. So maybe you might think of this series here in the following ways. As a primer for Nunes' autobiography out this fall, our series will only cover the 1950s and 1960s, and his book almost surely is going to be focused on his leadership role after that. I am looking forward to his book, and I hope you are too. And also think of this series as a prequel of sorts to our 11-part series last fall on the opening of Walt Disney World. I haven't recorded all of the episodes just yet, but I'm pretty sure that this series, more focused on the world of Walt Disney, will dovetail fairly nicely into that other series, more focused on Roy Disney and the resort that he, Nunes, and many others opened just outside of Orlando back in 1971. So if you're ready, here we go. Walt Disney World is a massive dream unfurled across swamplands in the center of Florida. It's twice as large as the island of Manhattan. Its four theme parks receive roughly 60 million visitors each year, making the resort the most visited tourist destination in the world. It's developed a deep fan base with some who make multiple visits each year. In ways, Disney World is an expansion of the first Disney park in California, but in other ways, it's a complete transformation of Walt's initial vision. The story of Disneyland can be expressed as a single narrative largely focused on Walt Disney. But the story of Walt Disney World is not a single narrative. Rather, it's a set of stories with an ensemble cast who together, over many years, produced the largest vacation resort in the world, a resort that, at one time, also included plans for a futuristic city. The story of its creation has tangents to unbuilt parks in St. Louis and South Florida and side avenues focused on replicating the entertainment culture of Southern California into the agricultural and ranch community of Orlando. But this story also has threads that connect the beginning of Disneyland to the opening of Walt Disney World, threads that also connect the people who operated the park with those who designed it. One of these threads concerns an unlikely candidate for corporate leadership, a young man looking for a summer job who wanted to become a high school football coach, but instead took a position with Disney. Though large parts of the Disney World story belong to the brothers Walt and Roy and two designers such as Dick Irvine and Herb Ryman, one of the most significant and far-reaching threads belongs to Dick Nunes, a man who took Walt's vision from California to Florida, a man whose ambitions transformed himself 
and also the company for whom he worked. In this series, we will take a look at Dick Nunes' early years at Disneyland, his experiences with Walt, and his ideas about how the decision-making center of Disneyland and Disney World should be changed, so that people who operated the park had more seats at the planning table, alongside those who worked in design. Among other things, this is not only the story of how Disneyland was started from the point of view of those who operated the park, but also how the voice of those people was amplified through a manager who would eventually oversee them all. Dick Nunes, as an adult, would explain that he came from a background of limited means. His father, Doyce, had finished the sixth grade while his mother, Winnie, had finished the tenth grade. Together, they started a family when they were very young. They were, respectively, 19 and 17 years old, parents trying to make ends meet. They named their first boy Doyce Jr. They lived in their hometown of Cedarton, Georgia, located near the Alabama border. Cedarton was supported by textile mills and a rubber plant. The town was a string of factories surrounded by small homes. Eight years later, during the worst of the Depression, on May 30th, 1932, they became parents for a second time. This time, they named their son Richard, though most everyone would call him Dick. Quote, I came from a poor family, said Nunes, and I saw athletics as a way to get an education. While young, Nunes moved with his family first to Dallas and then to Los Angeles, a growing city that would provide more opportunities. His father was a chromium plater working with metal, and his mother worked part-time in grocery stores handing out samples and demonstrating new products. His brother, Doyce, spent time in the Navy and then went to UCLA, a state school where he studied history. But Dick was far less bookish than his older brother. By his early teens, Nunes was focused on football. At Horace Mann Junior High, he was a receiver and found that his abilities on the field gave him a little notoriety around town. His family lived just south of Los Angeles, near Central Alameda and Huntington Park, in suburbs that were beginning to swell after the war. Beyond football, he was interested in positions of leadership. In ninth grade, he ran for class president, a position he lost, though only by a little, to a classmate in a runoff election. But the experience gave him a sense that positions like this might interest him in the future. During his first year of high school, he was the star of the manual arts JV team, but off the field. He struggled to pass some subjects, particularly those focused on traditional academics. Even though his brother, Doyce Jr., had excelled in college, Nunes found himself challenged by some topics in high school. To protect his grades, Nunes migrated towards shop courses, as they were easier to ace than math and English, even though this path would limit careers he might later pursue. One afternoon, the lead high school football coach, Jim Blewett, pulled him aside. Blewett was a big man with wide shoulders, well-known across town. Nunes, you want to play football for me? Nunes, always polite when talking to his elders, said, yes, sir. Well, you get yourself on some academic course. Nunes, wishing to defend himself, said, well, sir, I'm in a shops course. But before he could complete his thought, Blewett stopped him with a finger pressed into his chest. Look, you keep doing what you're doing, you'll get a scholarship. Because Nunes wanted to be on Blewett's varsity team, he changed his course of study. He knew by the man's tone that these things were significant, but years later he would admit that, even though his brother had loved college, quote, I didn't know what a scholarship was. In the months that followed, Blewett worked with Nunes on his field abilities. There were drills, and plenty of them, lift drills, mirror drills, angling drills. The coach talked to all of the boys about working together, doing jobs that contributed to team goals, and also being respectful on the field as they represented not only themselves, but the team and also their school. When Nunes was ready, 
Blewett placed him on the field as a left end, a defensive player. He was fast and aggressive, filled with determination. That fall, he quickly became one of the standouts on the varsity team. There were times that, while chasing after a pass, it appeared as though Nunes, through some inner strength, launched himself to intercept the ball. Off the field, friends, as always, called him Dick, but on the field he was number 25. All through the season, the manual arts games were attended by scouts for local college programs. The person most captivated by Nunes' performance was Dick Enberg, coach of the USC Trojans. He came to multiple games to watch Nunes and a couple of other players. Halfway through his senior year, Nunes was offered a scholarship to attend USC, one of the most prestigious schools on the West Coast. As an 18-year-old floating on local fame, Nunes believed that his ability in football would take him through college and then into the pros, where he would make not only a name for himself, but perhaps a small fortune as well. As a scholarship student, Nunes majored in education, as the education department trained players to become school coaches. Beyond sports, he participated in the Air Force ROTC, following a military tradition initially established by his brother. But his focus remained on the field, where he spent hours practicing plays before each game. He absorbed the mantras of a defensive end, tackle head-on, force ball carriers to the sideline, it's better to position your body correctly than to make a big tackle. Then there was this, you always represent your school. During his first year, Nunes sprained his ankle, shortening his season and forcing him to miss a key game in New York. But in his sophomore year, he blazed onto the green to become one of the rising stars. He was described as a, quote, deadly tackler and a, quote, sensational defensive halfback, a player who intercepted four passes in a single game, including one he returned for a touchdown. On the field, he was able to connect with something essential inside of himself. Once in his helmet, he could feel a change come over him. He described the sensation as, quote, adrenaline and a lot of pride. In academics, he was still a B student. He did better than average and kept his grades high enough to be a member of the first academic all-star team. But football, along with his fraternity, were the twin centers of his life. These were also the locations where he met another young player, Ron Miller, who would, quite by accident, change his life. At the time, Ron Miller was also focused on football. Like Nunes, he hoped someday to be picked up by a pro team. He was tall, good-looking, and well-liked around campus. He was also dating Walt Disney's 19-year-old daughter, Diane. One weekend, Ron and Diane invited some of the USC players over to Walt Disney's house, which was located in the hills above the city. Situated on a double lot, the Disney property was divided into two areas. The upper grounds held a large ranch-style house, and the gardens with their lower grounds held a scale model railroad. The railroad was outfitted with a live steam locomotive, roughly one-eighth the size of a real one, along with similarly sized boxcars big enough for guests to ride on, sitting atop their peaked wooden roofs. The tracks were arranged through gardens and past miniature buildings. They moved over a trestle and into a tunnel. As the train curved into its loading area, a tritone whistle sounded its arrival. The world of Walt Disney couldn't have been more different than the life Nunes had known growing up. Not only did the Disneys have a small mansion for a house, they had a second lot devoted to a train that would better fit inside of an amusement park. Beyond the train, the Disneys also had a bonus room set up like a diner, where Walt Disney himself made milkshakes for his guests. Standing behind a blender, he acted as though this type of part-time service job was nothing more than a wonderful hobby. For the past year, Nunes had met big-dollar donors at football games, men who worked in rarefied circles of money and influence, men for whom Nunes was just another athlete battling for their alma mater. Dressed in suits and silk ties, these men largely wanted respect. But Nunes saw that Walt, walking around in a striped engineer's cap, wasn't like this. He had mannerisms that made him seem approachable, qualities that suggested he too had known hard times. Quote, I went to his house, Nunes said, got on the train, 
Frankly, he was talking about this project he was going to be doing. He was very proud of it. The project, though not yet called Disneyland, was an amusement park that Walt wanted to build somewhere in the Los Angeles area, a project that no doubt would be something like his railroad. At this point in his life, based on his performance on the field, Nunes thought that his early dreams would become a reality, that college ball would lead to the pros and that pros would lead to a career in coaching. This was more or less the dream he had developed during his final year of high school. It was a dream shared by others on his team. But for Nunes, this dream didn't even last three semesters. In a late November game against crosstown rival UCLA, Nunes moved in to tackle Don Stalwick at the scrimmage line. Nunes had a reputation for being aggressive, leaning into each hit. But this time, something happened. He connected with Stalwick, but then the field shifted beneath him. Stalwick went down. But in the tussle, Nunes found himself lifted and angled, turned shoulder first toward the ground as well. Over the past six years, he'd been hit many times. He lay there a moment, taking in a few breaths, then he rose. But this time was different. Stadium lights slanted down on him as his teammates turned their heads, making sure he was okay. Nunes stood there for a moment, still stunned. Then, with a slow gait, he walked off the field. The coach directed him to the bench where he took off his helmet. He sat there and looked off at the game. All that grass and his teammates. The world was happening around him, yet he wasn't taking it in. Later, he explained he didn't remember what had happened for 20, maybe 30 minutes. Quote, the next thing I recall, I was sitting on the bench in the middle of the fourth quarter. He was surprised when the coaches were discussing how the UCLA team was easier to manage without their star player, Paul Cameron. Bit by bit, Nunes realized at some point over the past hour, Cameron too had been taken out of the game due to an injury. The whole thing must have played out on the field directly before him, but Nunes had no memory of it. When Nunes talked about going back in, Dr. Willis Jacobus, part of the USC medical staff, said that he was out of the game at least for today. Beyond the mind fog, the initial problem Nunes felt was a marble of pain centered in his neck. Strained muscles, he thought, something that likely would loosen up overnight. Once the game was over, Nunes went to the locker room with the other guys. He told the coaches he was fine, but that night back in his room, the pain didn't go away as it had in the past from other injuries. Instead, it migrated up his neck and swelled into his head, a tightness that seemed to grip his mind. Only days later, after complaining of a blinding headache, was he taken in for a full medical examination. Doctors looked at the x-rays, then gave him the bad news. Nunes hadn't strained muscles. He'd broken a cervical vertebra. Then they explained what this meant. He'd broken his neck, but somehow he was still walking. All winter, Nunes wore a neck brace to stabilize his spine as it healed, but he felt his neck was bolted in place like that of a robot. He wasn't able to move it side to side nor up and down. At first, he believed he would somehow return to the field once he recovered. But over time, that dream began to fade, as did the vision of himself playing with the pros. Beyond sports, he was forced to leave ROTC. He was limited in his social life. Doctors ordered him to wear the brace for months. He could take it off briefly for a shower or a photo, but the metal contraption, for the most part, became part of him. He wore it all spring and even into summer. In his mind, a dark curtain came down around the image of himself he had hoped to become. In its place, he saw a blankness. He was a young man wondering what he would do after college. It wasn't the first time that a force outside of his control altered his life. There had been some difficult experiences as he grew up, but this was far larger, something that unmade him. If he saw any silver lining, it was this. Because the injury took place on the USC football field, USC would allow Nunes to retain his athletic scholarship until he graduated, even though he no longer played ball. Now sidelined, 
he thought about how to reshape his life. His initial vision wasn't grand. It was a vision which moved him only a small step away from the impulse that had brought him to college. Quote, I still wanted to coach, he said. If he couldn't be on the field himself, perhaps he could lead others there. After years of work, he received a bachelor's degree in education in 1954, but that wasn't enough to place himself in a good job with employment security. Quote, so I started going through the trials and tribulations of getting my master's degree in education. This degree required more planning, as grad school wasn't covered by his football scholarship. To support himself, he worked as a student teacher, which in his district was also called a directed teacher. He also worked as a screen extra for Hollywood productions. When one local coach died, leaving an opening at a nearby school, his supervising teachers urged him to apply, even though he hadn't finished his directed teaching program. His experience as a player on the USC field, along with his experience in junior high and high school, hopefully would make up for the supervised hours he still needed to complete. He dressed up in his best suit, which included blue suede shoes, and went down to the district office to interview with the hiring manager. Nunes listed his experience, discussed his desire to coach, and explained that, Though he still had six months left to finish his directed teaching and degree program, he hoped the county might make an exception. From the way the hiring manager looked down at him with irritated eyes, Nunes knew that the interview was not going well. Quote, The guy said, sit down, Nunes recalled, and about half an hour later he was still chewing me out, saying, who did I think I am that I didn't need directed teaching? By now, Nunes had learned that it was inappropriate to speak back to people in power. The world was arranged as a hierarchy, and Nunes knew that, at the moment, he was near the bottom, at least as far as the county school system was concerned. He felt irritation building inside of him, but off the field, he had found few outlets to express such emotions. That had been one beautiful thing about football. On the field, he could direct all of his emotions into making the perfect tackle, or rising into the night to make an interception, plucking the ball from the air and bringing it in tight to his chest. At the end of the meeting, Nunes shook the interviewer's hand in such a way as to apply pressure, thereby communicating his frustration while thanking him. The end result, though, was this. Nunes was still without a good-paying job and needed some way to support himself over summer and to pay for his final year in school. That May, he turned to one of his former USC teammates for advice. The teammate was Ron Miller, who had recently married Walt Disney's daughter, Diane. There was a level of tension between Ron and Walt, as Diane had married Ron shortly after she had become pregnant. But Miller urged Nunes to apply at that park Walt had talked about, a place that, when opened, would be called Disneyland. Quote, I went down and interviewed, Nunes said. I was really spiffy. I had a great suit on. Again, he wore his blue suede shoes. The man interviewing him was Van Arsdale France, whose job it was to both hire and train the operation staff for Disneyland. Quote, the first thing that Van France said was, do you know how to use a broom? Though Nunes had hoped to be hired for something beyond janitorial work, he said he knew how to use one. And then, over the next half hour, explained that he had a degree in education. He was good at presenting ideas, good at talking to small groups of people. Van France understood that these qualities might be put to use training newly hired ride operators and ticket takers at this experimental amusement park. The following week, while going through orientation in a chance meeting, Nunes was spotted by Walt in the hallway. Walt tilted his head slightly in recognition, then approached the young man. Uh, don't I know you, he said. What's your name? Nunes told him that he had visited the house with Ron Miller. Oh, yeah, Walt continued. You played football at USC. What do you do here? Oh, well, sir, Nunes said. I'm in orientation training, but I'll do anything they ask me. At this, both men laughed, and Nunes sensed that this had been the right answer. Quote, Walt was looking for gophers, Nunes later explained that he could teach. After orientation, 
Van France assigned Nunes to himself as his assistant. He was hired on March 27, 1955. He made, quote, a buck eighty an hour, but at least there was the possibility of overtime. From his experience in football in college, Nunes generally believed that the path to success was achieved by working with older men who served as mentors and could help him understand new roles that were beyond those he had known as a boy. Van France might be one of these people, someone to show him how teaching and business went together. Together, they would train the 600 people needed to operate the park, which would be an enormous task. As Disneyland opened in seven weeks, and so far, the park had hired at most a few dozen individuals. Like Nunes, Van France was a recent Disney hire. Previously, he had trained people in Texas to work at an aircraft plant where they built planes both for military and commercial use. From the start, France could see that the Disneyland project held an implicit hierarchy of power. The first people Walt employed sought to create a funding stream to support the project. Next came the art directors and architects to develop usable plans. After that, ride designers and engineers, then the landscape architects. Last to be hired was the personnel director and the operations team. In terms of an organizational structure, Walt oversaw the art directors and ensured that their vision, mediated by his direction, shaped the park. The operations team, in many ways, was one that didn't require his deep personal supervision. Walt believed that a man like Van France, along with a few other managers, should be able to hire and supervise 600 employees who would sell tickets, operate rides and manage Walt's vision. As a specialist in training, Van France didn't disagree. The week after Dick Nunes was hired, the first week of June 1955, he visited the construction site to find that the area looked nothing like an amusement park. He saw endless streets of dirt and half-finished buildings. Though the lower half of the castle was complete, the upper portion was encased in scaffolding with some roof sections nothing more than sheets of plywood. Around the castle was a wide circle of dirt with no hardscape, no moat, and no landscaping of any kind, except for a couple of pine trees still in planting boxes. The area called Adventureland had a boathouse with a lookout tower, but the jungle ride was still a dry ditch with plants on raised islands, but none of the mechanical beasts had yet arrived. The exteriors of Main Street were mostly finished the second story of the opera house was framed in with open beams and empty window frames. The street itself held no tracks for the streetcar, no sidewalks, and like everything else wasn't paved. On June 2nd, a work crew was just beginning to lay out town square with sections of cement. Nunes could see that there was a tremendous amount of construction that needed to be completed before the park opened in six weeks. But his job wasn't to finish the park, rather to work with Van France to train locals to operate the attractions and staff the stores. Two years earlier, when Walt had purchased the property, he had also acquired a few houses, mostly where farm families had lived. One of these houses, officially called the Vandenberg House, was given to Van France and Nunes both for their offices and as the space to train new hires. Their offices had once been bedrooms, and the living room, once some walls were removed, was converted into an open presentation hall. The house was located across the street from the park in an area still occupied by free-roaming chickens and a few orange trees. Though the house had an official name, everyone at the site called it the White House, as its exterior was entirely white. Van France had no experience in outdoor amusements, neither did Nunes. Van France was a reflective man, a thinker, a bit of an eccentric. Quote, Van always seemed to have a cigarette with an impossibly long ash hanging from his mouth, one Disneyland employee recalled. France believed that successful training programs didn't focus on job duties, rather on a workplace attitude or identity that would shape the community for new hires. He didn't much like the term training. You could train parrots or dogs. Quote, it's about developing people, he said. If the park was to be successful, 
new hires shouldn't concentrate on individual tasks, such as stocking shelves or selling tickets, but instead on some larger goal, such as ensuring that guests enjoyed themselves. In terms of a job introduction program, this was a paradigm shift, asking that new employees create engaging experiences for guests rather than complete a list of activities. The program's theme was simple. Employees at Disneyland would create happiness for others. The program encouraged new hires to see their positions more as hosts than as employees. They should think of park guests as friends they had invited to an event. Individual job functions, such as cash handling or meal preparation, could be learned on the job. Once this concept was finalized, Branson Nunes, as his assistant, arranged a program to introduce new hires to principals that would help define this new type of amusement park, one that functioned more like a resort hotel as opposed to the carny playgrounds down at the beach. At times, France weaved in other conceptual elements into his training materials. He explained that new employees weren't joining a business. They were now part of a great outdoor show in which they took part in the Wild West or on a main street of decades past. The handbook given to new employees included a quote from Walt, quote, it is you who will make Disneyland truly a magic kingdom and a happy place for the millions of guests who visit us now and in the future. In creating happiness for our guests, we hope that you will find happiness in your work and in being an important part of Disneyland. The quote was placed next to a photo of Walt beside a miniature model of the castle, as the castle by the time this booklet was printed was still not complete. In the days that followed, Nunes's work brought him repeatedly into contact with both Walt and Roy Disney, as they both needed to sign off on many elements in the training program. But once Van France had their approval, he and Nunes began to train new hires, most of them part-time hourly workers. Together, France and Nunes created presentation cards that emphasized key concepts. One such card featured the slogan, you can create happiness, superimposed over a graphic of an oversized exclamation point to emphasize the importance of this idea. Other materials featured promotional stills of Lady and the Tramp, Disney's newest animated film, to demonstrate the family-centered entertainment values of the Disney company, which was a co-owner of Disneyland Incorporated. Beyond this, a set of photos presented sample haircuts that men and women might adopt for their roles. Though in later years, the training materials would refer to Disneyland employees as cast members, highlighting their role in a show. During that first training season, Disneyland employees were called hosts and hostesses, highlighting the importance of cordiality. For Nunes, these training materials felt a little like the old mantra of respect your school that he'd absorbed while playing football. The centerpiece of the training materials, however, was a set of slides depicting what new hires would see in Disneyland. The slides were arranged from artist renderings and models, as Disneyland still held large open areas of dirt. Yet it was this moment when new hires understood with clarity that this park would be unlike anything they had seen elsewhere in California. Each morning, Nunes arrived at the White House, where he and France could park their cars in what once was the Vandenbergs family driveway. The exterior of the building still looked exactly like a house with potted plants, an azalea bush, and even a doorbell, though the art department had created a sign to hang from the second-story balcony, which read, Disneyland, Temporary Personnel Annex. It also included a graphic of the Disneyland castle. Inside the house on the ground floor was a training area, but even here to save money, the space was cobbled together with mismatched equipment. There were some student-style seats, like those in a public school, where a small desktop was attached to a chair, and there were a couple rows of folding chairs, some of which were pushed up against a long, narrow table. Training sessions were limited, largely due to the available space, to groups of about 12 to 15 people, meaning that multiple sessions needed to be managed each day to initiate the 600 employees that the park would need when it opened. As the groups came through, Nunes could see that most of these new hires were younger than him. 
there were a handful of high school teachers looking for work during summer recess and on weekends. There were also a few workers recently laid off from defense plants that were downsizing after the Korean War. But by far, the majority of applicants were recent high school graduates who had not gone off to college or started a career. For Nunes, the social arrangement of Disneyland was different than that of his undergraduate classes, a football team, or his directed teaching program. In the high schools, as an assistant teacher, Nunes was one of the youngest, if not the youngest adults, surrounded by seasoned professionals. But here, he occupied a unique space. There were a handful of experienced managers, such as Van France, individuals a decade or two older than him who oversaw divisions. But the vast majority of new hires were younger than him and were looking for direction. It was a space that he hadn't yet mastered, but its arrangement suggested possibilities not available to him in the school system possibilities that would expand as the park moved to open. I'll be back next week with a new episode that looks at the opening of Disneyland, the developing relationship between Walt Disney and Dick Nunes, and how Nunes begins to organize the park. As you know, we're an ad-free, listener-supported podcast. Without subscribers, we would simply cease to exist. We do just two things deep dives on stories related to the history of the Disney studio and parks, and news and analysis of current events as they relate to the Disney company. If you enjoy these episodes, please support our efforts by becoming a monthly Bandcamp subscriber. On Bandcamp, you'll find dozens and dozens of extra episodes, but the best reason to subscribe is to make sure that this podcast continues to exist. You can subscribe at dhipodcast.bandcamp.com. I'll leave a link down in the show notes. Until then, this is Todd James Pierce. <laughs>